it's not available right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not what we want. Don't. YouTube down? <laughs> Just my uh, little world here. Uh, it, it kicked me out, so let me go back in. Do we go for a fact you're not alive? We are not live. Okay. Boom, we're live. <laughs> it's... <laughs> there were plenty of Apollo launches where there was a hole that, you know, T minus <laughs> one. <laughs> We're live? Oh. Okay, I guess we actually are live, but I'm, I've lost the uh, YouTube page went down, so let me get that back up. But we are good to go, so you guys are... Okay, we are on, live. We, we are live on stream. Sorry about that. It's actually that. been a little hard to tell, because <laughs> YouTube is probably getting crushed these days. Yeah, probably is. All right, well then we will just get going. Um, hi everybody and, and welcome. This is uh, the first episode of a new program we're starting here at Lowell Observatory just to stay in touch with everybody during this era of quarantines and lockdowns. Um, I'm Jeff Hull, I'm an astronomer and the director here at Lowell. Uh, just a couple of us in the room here with uh, Phil Massey, one of the other astronomers at Lowell, and the disembodied voice behind the camera is CJ von Buchwaldwright, our IT manager. Um, isolated at home and also tuned in, um, Danielle Adams, our Deputy Director for Marketing and Communications. Um, we're starting a number of new online uh, reaching out just to stay in touch with all of our, our visitors that we can't have here because we're shut down. Um, so we're going to be coming to you with this, uh, this little series weekly. Um, we're calling it Cosmic Coffee because we're doing it in the morning. And we're trying to also turn it into a little bit of a public service. Uh, each week before the show, we're going to go out to one of the excellent local coffee shops here in Flagstaff and buy some products from them and give them a little shout out on the show. So for any local viewers, uh, there's no particular order, this is not a ranked list or anything. Um, we just decided we'll start with the Kickstand Cafe. Here's one of their cups right here. Um, easy to find near Flag High down there um, on Humphreys and Sullivan. Um, please go out and continue, consider supporting them through their, their takeout line. It's very easy, you can order online and uh, help our businesses keep going through uh, this uh, difficult economic time. So, um, now we'll get to the topic du jour. Each week with this show, we're gonna do a different uh, topic, uh, sometimes astronomical, sometimes we'll do other things like, like next week, we're gonna give you a behind the scenes look. We are up here at the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory in the Astronomy Lab. About 50 feet away are the cool new telescopes that unfortunately nobody can look through right now. We're gonna give you a behind the scenes look at those next week. Today, we figured for the first of these shows, let's just pick one of the biggest stories, things, you, you, something you might have heard about in the news, and one of those is going to take us today to the constellation Orion, which is on the screen right back here. One of the brightest and most distinctive constellations in the sky because of an unusual number of really bright stars, and, and it's the belt right there, those three stars right in a row, is arguably the most distinctive thing up there in the winter sky in the northern hemisphere. So let's put up a few names. Um, we'll be talking about several of the stars in Orion today. Right down here in his uh, left foot is Rigel. Right up there in the left shoulder, uh, Bellatrix, and yeah, the Harry Potter reference there is, is valid. J.K. Rowling used a number of star names and celestial references in the Harry Potter series. And then the other star that we're going to really focus on today is Betelgeuse. Now, Rigel and Betelgeuse are the two brightest stars in Orion, but over the past several months, Betelgeuse has been acting really weird, and Phil here happens to be an expert in these kind of stars, and he and a collaborator have just written a really nice paper about all of this. So we're going to talk about what's going on. So, Jeff, this is what um, Orion usually looks like, and as you said, Betelgeuse is usually one of the two brightest stars in Orion. Recently, it hasn't been. Um, before we talk about that, I'd like to point out how colorful uh, Betelgeuse is. It's very red, and it's red because it's a very cool star. Um, the surface temperature of Betelgeuse is about 3600 Kelvin, or 6000 degrees Fahrenheit. In contrast, a star like Rigel 
which is blue, is about 20,000 degrees Kelvin. Now, one crude way of, of actually measuring the temperature of a star is by just um, taking, measuring its color. And um, it's not a very accurate means because other things can affect the color. For instance, if you have dust, that can make the star appear redder than it actually is for its temperature. Um, this coffee cup that I'm holding is brown. And it's brown because it's the light that's reflecting off of it is brown. The cu cup is absorbing all the other optical uh, wavelengths. If we were to turn the lights off in this room and, and look at it with an infrared camera, we would see that it was glowing. And it's glowing because it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If you were to look at Jeff and me, we would be glowing with the same color in the infrared. Well, hopefully we'd be a little bit cooler than 100 Fahrenheit, or we might be in trouble. Don't worry. But, um, but if you were to take this coffee cup and heat it up to a temperature of 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, it would be the same color as Betelgeuse. It's just it's part of how physics operates. It would be some decidedly hot coffee. It certainly would. And if you have an electric range, when you turn that on, the fact that the coils are glowing red is because their temperature is a couple thousand degrees. Anyway, um, in early December, going back to how Betelgeuse, uh, the exciting thing that Betelgeuse has been doing recently, in, in early December, an astronomer pointed out that Betelgeuse had gotten uh, fainter than had ever been seen in 50 years of continuous monitoring. And, uh, Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star, and red supergiant stars uh, are all variable, but they're variable in their brightness by a couple of percent. This was a much more dramatic thing. If you went outside and looked at the constellation of Orion with your eye in late December, you'd say, wow, something's yeah. really up. It was dramatic. It was really faint. It was really faint. And this is a picture that I took in January. Um, and you can see that Betelgeuse is now nowhere near as bright as it was previously. In fact, here's Bellatrix again. And uh, Bellatrix is usually the third brightest star in the constellation of Orion. Betelge Betelgeuse, um, sorry, Bellatrix is usually the third brightest star in the constellation of Orion. And Betelgeuse was actually fainter than that. Mm -hmm. So it was already down to the third brightest um, star. Yeah, and so where, where Remind me, where did it bottom out? So it bottomed out. Um, first, let's look at this comparison side by side. And, yeah, and this makes it even more dramatic. Um, you can see that relative to the, the exposures are quite the same. But if you compare Betelgeuse in each of the two frames to the other stars in Orion, you can see how much fainter it got. Um, it bottomed out, Jeff, in about mid-February. And you can see that this was um, really a historic low. It was down to about 40% of its normal brightness. Right, yeah. Over here on this, uh, the left side of this chart, you can see the, the astronomer's crazy upside down magnitude scale. And, and yeah, it's dimmed by about a full magnitude, which takes it down to about 40% of its original brightness. And of course, this is when we started seeing in the news lots of speculations that this thing is about to blow, right? <clears throat> Right. Now, Betelgeuse is going to blow up someday. Yeah. Uh, it could happen next week. It could happen in 100,000 years. But um, Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star, uh, and these are massive stars. Betelgeuse started its life with a mass maybe 20 times the mass of the sun. And these stars, when they die, don't just fade away. They go out in a spectacular supernova burst. For a short period of time, they're brighter than any of the other stars all the other stars in the galaxy put together. Betelgeuse is so close to us, only 650 light years away, that when Betelgeuse does turn into a supernova, it's going to be bright enough to be seen during the day for months, and at night it will be almost as bright as a full moon. That would be pretty spectacular. I'm kind of rooting for it, actually, but, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen, and the, the dimming does not necessarily imply that it's about to explode. No, despite what was going on in the popular press, um, it was very hard to see how there could be any connection between what was going on on the surface of this big star and what was going on in its core. And what, when a star goes supernova, when a massive star uh, turns into a supernova, it's because it's run out of fuel in its core. And it's in its core 
where the nuclear reactions are happening. That for the first 90% of the star's life, it's converting hydrogen into helium. And it's only in the center where the temperatures and the pressures are high enough that you can actually cram the atoms together and form new atoms of uh, more complicated um, things. Structure. Structure. <laughs> right. Thank you, too. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Elements. Elements. Um, Those Elements. things. Um, and for the next 8% of its life, it then converts helium into carbon and oxygen. And the very atoms that we're breathing right now, the nitrogen in this room, the oxygen in these rooms, these were forged in the cores of stars like Betelgeuse. Carl Sagan was fond of saying that we are literally made of star stuff. And this is literally true. The carbon atoms in your body, the iron in your blood, these were all made in the centers of stars. Mm -hmm. Yep, we are, yeah, it's very true. We are literally star stuff, and, and we, we come from those thermonuclear forges. So if it's not a supernova, then what is going on, and how do we determine what, what's actually happening and causing the dimming? Well, one possibility, Jeff, was that um, it could be due to a large convection cell mm -hmm. on the surface of Betelgeuse. Now, red supergiant stars are expected to have very large convection. Now, you work on the sun. Mm -hmm. You're a solar physicist. Um, maybe you could tell us a Let's, little bit yeah. about convection on the sun. Sure, yeah. So, so to really figure out what's going on with Betelgeuse, therefore, if it's not an imminent supernova, unfortunately enough, we need to understand, or start talking a little bit about the physics of stars and how they work. So this is a very recent image of the sun from a fabulous new solar telescope, the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope, which just reached first light, um, almost uh, at the end of construction, unfortunately right now, shut down just like pretty much everything else. But they, they obtained this magnificent image of the surface of the sun. And what you're seeing here are the solar convective cells, these turbulent rising and falling uh, parcels of plasma, which is how the sun is transporting energy out to its surface. You can see the scale here, about 2,000 miles. The continental US is about 2,500 from the Atlantic to the Pacific. So these features that we're seeing 93 million miles away are only of order hundreds of miles across, so sort of the size of larger states. So what's actually going on here physically so as Phil was pointing out, um, the star generates its energy deep down in the core. And all that energy has to get out. And there's basically two ways that stars do that. You can do it by radiation, just photons streaming out through the star. Or you can do it by convection, these big bubbles of gas rising and falling. Nature will do whatever is most efficient. And it turns out that for cool stars, like the Sun and Betelgeuse, Beneath the surface, convection is the preferred way of doing it. And so you get this, this, this turbulent, seething um, surface. Now, the key point, I think, for what we're discussing today is the convection is one of the critical phenomena in the sun that leads to the increasing complexity of its magnetic field, which causes spots cool, dark spots on its surface. Now, for the sun, the spots, even at activity maximum, are pretty small and only cover a tiny fraction of a percent of the sun's surface. But for a monster like Betelgeuse, the situation is very different. That's right, Chuck. Um, this is not an actual picture. This is a computer simulation of what we expect the convection cells on a red supergiant star like Betelgeuse to look like. We know that Betelgeuse has a significant magnetic field, about one gauss actually. And so this, these convection cells should lead to very large spots. And so one possibility was that um, there was a very large spot that was just blocking the light from Betelgeuse. Um, one of the amazing things about Betelgeuse is that it's so big, about 800 times the size of the sun, and so close to us, about 650 light years, that using a special technique called infrarometry, it's actually possible to get an image of the surface of Betelgeuse. Yeah. It's not in very great detail, but this, um, this amazing pair of images was done at the European Southern Observatory. And the one on the left shows what 
Betelgeuse looked like when it was at its normal brightness. The one on the right shows you what it was looking like in December when it was getting faint. And we can see the southern hemisphere of Betelgeuse is being blocked by something. Now, what we didn't know is by what. It could have been a large uh, sunspot, well, a star spot, well, a Betelgeuse, a Betelgeuse spot. spot. Or it could have been a gigantic puff of dust. We know that red supergiants generate dust, that they undergo pulsations. These pulsations drive matter away from the star. And uh, as this is happening, dust um, uh, comes out of this material. It condenses out. Now, this dust is much smaller than the dust you find at least around my house. Um, and uh, it, but there can be a lot of it. Um, this happens sort of episodically with red supergiants. It doesn't happen continuously. And so one possibility was that Betelgeuse had just belched out a large plume of dust. I definitely like, like the idea of a belch rather than just a puff. Because if it really is a belch, then we can, we can issue a press release with some very cool sound effects that I think would be fairly unique in the scientific uh, uh, literature. So, so anyway, so clearly something's going on here with Betelgeuse. And now we've actually got something we can test. Because if it's a spot, we know that spots are significantly cooler than the surrounding area. So if there's this giant humongous spot, we should be able to take the star's temperature and see if it's gotten cooler. So now the question is, how do you take a star's temperature? Well, not like this, Jeff. This is what you would do with Sirius Dog Star. But it's not how we would do it with a red server jump. Um, with a red supergiant, so red supergiants are cool enough that you actually have molecules forming in the outer layers of the star. Now, other stars are too hot for this to happen, but molecules are very, very, the formation of these molecules are very sensitive to temperature. So at 4,000 degrees, you have almost none of these, these titanium oxide molecules forming, but at cooler temperatures, the um, there was more and more of them, and so by using a spectrograph, which breaks the light into its component pieces and taking a picture of the spectrum, you could measure how much titanium oxide there was, how deep these bands are, and you could fit a computer model to um, how deep these titanium oxide bands are. With this, we could measure the temperature very accurately, about plus or minus 25 Kelvin or plus or minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Imagine being able to measure the average temperature of a star to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's amazing. In fact, maybe, maybe some of our viewers right now were online for our Equinox live stream last Thursday. And we were talking a little bit about the Equinox and the Sun. And I put up, um, I showed Nigel Sharp's spectrum of the yes. Sun. And we were talking about just what an amazing tool spectroscopy is and, and all of the things we can tell about a star just from observing the spectrum. One of those is the temperature. So what'd you get? So um, back in 2004, Dr. Emily Levesque and Dr. Knut Olsen of NOAO mm -hmm. um, and I measured the temperatures of 74 um, red supergiants. This is um, Dr. Levesque 16 years ago when she was an undergraduate, and we were observing with the Kitt Peak 2.1 meter telescope outside of Tucson. And among the other 74, among these 74 red supergiants that we observed was Betelgeuse. And um, we, what Dr. Levesque uh, suggested to me was now that Betelgeuse was faint, we should repeat the measurement. We should see whether or not Betelgeuse had the same temperature now as when we observed it in 2004. If it was much cooler, then the explanation for its stemming was almost certainly that there was a large spot on the surface due to these large convection cells. If we got the same temperature, it would almost certainly mean that it had to be due to a giant puff of dust. Right. And so you went out, you went out to our very own facility, and I think you had a very similar instrument to this, too. We did. We used the Lowell Discovery Telescope um, and the spectrograph that was the cousin to the spectrograph I just showed you. Um, I did this on February 14th, which you will remember from the graph, was right when Betelgeuse was at its minimum in light. Um, while I went on to the next rest of my program that night, I uh, reduced the data, and Emily was in Seattle po 
poured over her laptop waiting for the, for the spectrum, and I emailed it to her, and within an hour, we had our answer. And the answer was that the spectrum was almost identical to the spectrum that we had taken in 2004. The depth of these titanium oxide bands was the same. The temperature was agreed to certainly within 50 degrees Kelvin. And that was way too close a match to be able to explain the dimming. One of the unusual things that we found, we expected that if the ants were dust, that there would be a lot less blue light than red light, because the dust usually um, removes the blue light. And that's why sunsets are so red. But what we found was the light was being um, attenuated uniformly throughout the spectrum. And that would imply that the grain particles, the dust particles, were a very large size compared to the usual ones. Now, these sort of large grain dust had been observed around Betelgeuse in the past. And our good friend and colleague, Sumner Starfield, at, the, at Arizona, Univers Arizona State University, had also found that uh, during a classic uh, Nova outburst in the early 1990s, that there was also similar large grain dust. So it could be that when you have a really large puff of dust given off by a red supergiant, that the grain sizes are also unusually large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and just, just to, be, to be clear, um, you've got two observations here separated by 16 years with essentially very similar instruments. So, so the calibrations and reductions are all quite reliable. If this had been a huge spot, basically the black spectrum would be sagging well below the red. It would be pretty substantial. Um, That's this right. is a sensitive indicator. So there we seem to have the answer, at least for this episode. It's not a spot because we have this temperature test we can do. And it is, in fact, the belch. And so I'm going to be in touch with Danielle to see about uh, press release images and sound effects and all that. So what's Betelgeuse doing now? It's gone into self-quarantine. <laughs> um, actually, no. It's about halfway back to its normal um, brightness now. And yeah. I expect that by the next winter season, when Orion is again prominent in our skies, mm -hmm. that Betelgeuse will look the way that it always has right. in the past. Right. But we could certainly, going forward, you, you never know. We could see future episodes where actually you go back and take a third spectrum uh, next winter and um, it in fact has changed because the whole spot has come up. This is a very dynamic star. Or maybe it won't be there anymore. Maybe it won't. <laughs> maybe it will have already gone supernova in which case we'll be out reading our books by, yeah. by Beetlejuice. And we would actually be pretty lucky because a supernova 650 light years away would be an incredible sight to see. So I'm rooting for the thing to go. But you know, we, we get this question a lot at our, our on-site Meet an Astronomer uh, weekly, uh, Meet an Astronomer out here at the, at the Open Deck Observatory. And I always say, you know, this could be, you could have this incredible supernova tomorrow or it could be 50,000 years, so don't hold your breath, right? But we, we shall see. So that sort of gets to the end of the, the sleuthing saga here. Um, I think at this point, we'll just stop and see if there are any questions that have come in on the stream that folks might want to ask. I'm happy to field a few of those. All right. Uh, yeah, we have one question from Jim Davies. Uh, ah, hi, Jim. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> he says, he asks, is the spectrum of Betelgeuse changing when it gets dimmer? So um, that's what we found was that it was not changing. Um, that was the um, that was the clincher that the temperature hadn't changed. The spectrum really is um, primarily shows what the temperature is of the star, and so um, although certainly as you know the convective cells come and go, there will be some right. minor changes in some lines that are sensitive to this or that. But overall, the sort of the, the gross properties of the spectrum were not changing, which was the smoking gun that led to the current result. Right. All right, we have a question from Tom Says. Uh, titanium dioxide, is it the only recognizable molecule? No, it's not, but it's the most, um, it's the strongest molecule that you get at these temperatures and pressures that you have in the red supergiant. Uh, but there are other uh, molecules that you see in red supergiant, so just not as um, And In fact, stars this cool have crazy spectra. You know, I, I do the somewhat hotter solar-like stars, and that, that, that's about enough for my brain. But these are these cool stars that, uh, whether they're healthy stars or supergiants, 
Yeah, there's just an incredible wealth of signatures in there because they're cool enough that these molecules can exist. Right. Uh, Richard Sauerburn asks, is it possible that a large exoplanet with an unusual orbit has passed between us and Betelgeuse, causing the dimming of the apparent brightness? So um, just from geometry, the answer would have to be no. Um, and also, the dimming has lasted for quite a while. So you would have to, for something to be blocking out a lot of the light, you'd have to be very, very close to Betelgeuse. And if you were moving, then you would not, um, yeah. And I mean, right, and given the size of Betelgeuse and the typical size of a planet, you can easily do the fraction that would be covered. You will see a dimming. I mean, you're absolutely right, and that's how we detect a lot of exoplanets, is looking for dimming, but it's usually this exquisitely tiny fraction of a percent, not a magnitude. If it is a, bell, oh, Albert Smith asks, if it is a belch with large dust particles, should we not see something in the absorption lines of its spectra? No, but what you would expect to see would be extra infrared radiation. And we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but after our study was done um, at ESO, they have, in fact, in, in the mid-infrared, found a lot of uh, uh, mid-IR emission that is typically found from hot dust. Uh, one more from Tom says, what does the spectrum show about the age of Betelgeuse? Is silicone... Silicon into iron happening. So the silicon into iron thing can only happen in the core of the star. And we're looking at the surface of the star. And so um, that would not be reflected at all in what we see at the surface. We would somehow have to be able to see what was going on in the center of the star. And we really don't have any way of doing that. When Betelgeuse does go into a supernova phase, when it does turn into a supernova, the one one it would, will get is that we'll have a flux of neutrinos arriving at the Earth about six hours mm -hmm. before the supernova explosion is seen. So if we're still around, and if we still have neutrino um, scientists, um, they will be able to say, hey, something cool is going to happen mm -hmm. in about six hours. I think we could also say, though, to that question, um, if we were into the silicon fusing phase, if, if I recall, I mean, that's the very last stage, and it's like hours, right, hours. it gets consumed. Exactly. So if, in fact, Betelgeuse is fusing silicon, there's going to be a really cool event tonight because there's not much time left. Yeah. All right, uh, this is from Todd. Uh, if given unlimited time and money for your research, is there more you would like to learn about Betelgeuse? <laughs> I will certainly take the unlimited money. So, <laughs> so one, of the, one of the things we didn't actually go into, so this exposure of Betelgeuse was very tricky, and we thought a long time about how we might do it. And the problem is, Betelgeuse, even though it was dim, dimmer than it usually is, it was still one of the brightest stars in the sky, and we're using one of the largest telescopes in the world. And so that was a bit of an issue because we didn't want to saturate that. We um, had to put in a uh, filter that dimmed the light by a factor of 10,000, and then it was only a three second exposure. So what I would do instead with my unlimited research money and time would be to, um, oh, we're already doing this, which would be study red supergiants in nearby galaxies. And my good friend and, Kath and colleague Catherine Nugent is doing this as part of her PhD thesis now with Dr. Emily Levesque at the University of Washington, trying to study the binary frequency of red supergiants in galaxies like the Andromeda Galaxy and um, the Magellanic Clouds, galaxies that are um, these stars that are much further away. And by being able to study hundreds of stars, you then learn something that you don't learn by just studying one star in great detail, but you can learn about the class of stars and you get a much greater understanding of what um, happens in general with these types of stars. Yeah, and with your unlimited time and money, yes. um, you could actually augment the very bread and butter that's that's so effective here at Lowell. You know, we the Lowell Discovery Telescope is our telescope, and we can go out as we have done for decades and do these programs where you're observing either a lot of things or a lot of things for a long time. Because building up those time series, if you stare at something long enough, guaranteed 
it will do something weird and unexpected, and you'll learn a lot by doing that. So with unlimited money, sure, yeah, we build dedicated facilities and just stare at these things and see what they do in the long term, um, which we did, I believe, 90 years ago when we had put a telescope right out here and just started staring at the patches of the sky and looking for a little ninth planet out there, and lo and behold, it turned up. <laughs> All right, uh, Jim Davies also asks, has the NPOI looked at Beetlejuice? I think they have. I, they have to, um, because it would be I know. infrafarometers. So that would be a question for Gerard Van Bell. I know they've done Altair. Um, um, off the top of my head, I actually, I assume they have, because it's one of the, the prime interferometric target, um, and right. certainly within reach. All right, uh, Tom Says asks, how does how much does Beetlejuice change in size? Mm, that's a good question. Um, it, you could see from that simulation that the, even the concept of size is a little bit tricky <laughs> when we're talking about um, a blobby star that um, has these large convective gaps and cells. And so um, what we know is that the overall luminosity of Betelgeuse hasn't changed very much historically. And we also know that the temperature hasn't changed very much historically. So that would argue that the radius hasn't changed. Now, at one time, Betelgeuse only had a radius of about eight times the size of the sun. And it's now 800. So during the course of its evolution, it's changed by a factor of 100. Yeah. But during uh, historical times, when Betelgeuse has been a red supergiant, um, there's no reason to think that its radius has, has varied very much. And we can put that into context. Um, just how big this thing is, 800 so times the size of the sun. Um, now, in very round numbers, Earth is, is what? About 100 uh, solar radii from the sun. So solar, radi solar diameter is roughly a million miles. We're roughly... Yeah. 100 million miles away. So, so 100. Now think, eight times that. You know, this this thing's enormous yeah. and, and very tenuous in its outer layers. I mean, it, it looks like there's a surface. You know, sometimes we talk about the surface of the sun. Actually, the the so-called surface is a very tenuous plasma, um, tens of thousands of times less dense than air. It's just where the visible light happens to be coming from. Now, take something like that and bloat it out. And you've got just an incredibly evanescent material out there. And in fact, the largest red supergiants that um, Dr. Levesque and I found when she was an undergraduate, um, the largest of these have a radius that's 1,600 times that of the sun. If you were to plunk it down where the sun is, its outer layers would fall between the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn. Yeah. Uh, Rita asks, how was the coffee? The coffee was very good, I thought. Mine was a decaf latte with um, just made with soy and with just a hint of vanilla. And that's that's very. I, I am an extremely boring person, and I just had a delicious house dark blend and very good. So kudos again to the good folks at Kickstand and go get your own cup. Good question, Rita. <laughs> uh, let's see where were we? Uh, we'll take a couple more here. Kendall says, is the apparent shape-shifting of Betelgeuse really? Um, yes, we think that the, the dark spot that we saw in the comparison between the two images of the surface of Betelgeuse, that what was going on was that this puff of dust mm -hmm. was not symmetrical, that it was just blocking off the light uh, from the southern hemisphere. That's a good point. I forgot to mention that. Okay. Christina says, if Beetlejuice goes supernova, will Orion lose his arm? <laughs> mm. Well, this comes, I think, then there's a central question that you raised earlier before we were on camera about whether Beetlejuice is the armpit of Yeah, of Orion right. Or... <laughs> so he will indeed. Um, so we, we characterize, I, I mentioned Beetlejuice as being Orion's right shoulder. I believe the, the Arabic name does, I think, actually refer to the armpit, but, but 
Shoulder seems a lot more dignified, but I think uh, Kendall raises a good point. You know, we think about, you go out every night and there's the stars and they go by every night and they're always there. And we tend to think of the universe as a sort of eternal and unchanging place. But as we've seen, this was an example where we could just look up there and see this thing is dramatically fainter, so that things are changing before our very eyes. And because stars like Betelgeuse have very short lifetimes, within probably about two million years, Orion is going to lose a whole lot more than just his arm. <laughs> I mean, this familiar shape is basically toast. Uh, right. Well, the, and of course, in the, in, the, uh, in the side here, there are some very, very massive stars, 40 times the mass of the sun. Those are going to um, last for well under, you know, a couple million years. A few million years yeah. at most, right. And, and the stars of the belt, all three of those, those are actually, they're all very different. They're really complicated systems. The one on the right um, in Taka over there, I, I think there's actually like six stars. I'd have to go look that up. But it, it's a multiple, but they're, they're big. And the center one, the Epsilon Orionis, is, I mean, the luminosity there is like 500,000 times the size of the sun. These are very massive stars, and they are all going to die um, young and violent. I, sometimes I date myself by calling these kinds of stars, think of them as the John Belushi's of the universe, right? They live hard and die young, right? All right, uh, Victoria Gurgis asks, why do we get the neutrinos, and how many will there be compared to other or normal emissions? Ah, well, this gets us into, um, in good area, question, Victoria. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, this is this is now like the car guys talking about magnetic brakes. Um, so the nuclear reactions that are going on in the core of the star, when we get the silicon going into iron, and then the iron, um, all these nuclear reactions have been um, exothermic up until that point. But what happens when you have iron trying to fuse? that's an endothermic reaction. And so the core itself actually collapses. And as part of that process, um, neutrinos are created. And the neutrinos make it their way out of the star very fast. Yeah. And, um, and we get a whole bunch of them. But how much is a whole bunch is something I don't know. A lot. Yeah, it's supposed yeah. to be a lot. All right, uh, Tom Wheeler asks, has NRAO looked at this recently and compared it with past data to look for any unique deltas in radio wavelengths? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Don't know if they have. All right, Eric Andrews asks, how fast would the dust have been traveling? Hmm. Ah, well, that's a good question. Um, so the kind of uh, hot stars that are in the soil, they have stellar winds that have velocities that are on the order of thousands of kilometers per second. But the outflow from a red supergiant, because the surface gravity is so low, it's something like 10,000 times smaller than the surface gravity on the sun, that this dust doesn't flow out at a very high rate of speed. It's more on the order of tens of kilometers per mm -hmm. second. But it would be a dramatic sight if you were if you could fly out there and see this thing, and the Indeed. circumstellar environment. It, it would just be a wondrous sight. It certainly would. Okay, uh, Britton Davis asks: Are there other stars that we can see going through the same process? Oh, red supergiants. Yes, red supergiants are in fact. Um, so, massive stars spend ninety percent of their time on the main sequence burning hydrogen. When they are burning helium, and that's about 10% of their lives, most of m most massive stars spend that time as red supergiants. And so we know in, say, the our own galaxy, um, hundreds of red supergiants. We know about hundreds of red supergiants in nearby galaxies mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So Good example we can we can use though. So in the northern hemisphere, of course, Orion is a winter constellation. So we do our meet and astronomer nights. I'm always pointing out Betelgeuse as prime example of a red supergiant. Then six months hence, um, always use Antares. Antares. And, yes. and there's a great story there too, because of course Scorpio, um, the scorpion in mythology, is the creature that killed Orion. 
And so, of course, the gods, when they set them into the stars, they put them on opposite sides of the sky so they could no longer bother each other. But Antares is another example of one of these just monstrous bloated, and, and it looks very red. And in fact, the very name Antares, Ant Ares, opposite of Mars, because frequently since Scorpio is in the zodiac, you find planets nearby, and it's a very similar color to the red planet, another one of our favorite objects here at Lowell. All right, uh, GKC Geoscience asks, how is the distance to Betelgeuse measured? Ah, well, this used to be a very difficult thing to do. You could, for stars that are relatively um, nearby, within about 100 parsecs, so about 300 light years, you could get a very accurate measurement by doing ground-based parallaxes. Now, if you were to take your finger and hold it in front of your face like this and open one eye and the other, you can see your finger shifting against the background of the wall. And the Earth is going around the sun. And so if you were to photograph a star field when the Earth is on one side of the sun, and then the same area of the sky when the Earth is on the other side of the sun, you have this baseline of 2 times 93 million miles. And that would allow you to triangulate any stars that were relatively nearby and get a very fundamental distance to them. Um, getting distances to more distant stars then relied upon these parallaxes, as they're called, in order to build up the distance ladder. But this incredible satellite called Gaia can now do parallaxes so, inc so amazingly accurate that we have a very exact measurement of the distance to um, Betelgeuse from the parallax measured from Gaia. Right. And, and that's, that, I mean, having those accurate distances is crucial to understanding the, the fundamental absolute properties of the star. We can really put a lot more understanding into place yeah. just by knowing how far away they are. And that was one reason that a lot of our, the work that I've been doing has been studying massive stars in nearby galaxies because at least when you're looking at stars in the nearby galaxy, you know that they're all at basically the same distance. Well, it was very tricky to do this in the Milky Way. It's now gotten much easier. We still have the problem of high and variable extinction due to patches of dust in the interstellar medium that, that messes things yeah, up. Yeah, the Milky Way is kind of a messy place. Well, and that's why I tried to avoid it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to butcher this name, but Sihaya Joni asks, is the dust a byproduct of something burning like a tire fire? No, it's, it's simply what condenses out of this material that's being thrown out of the star. Um, and it's, it is mainly actually silicates. Um, and the sort of typical size of this is on the order of a micron yeah. or half a micron, uh, where a micron is one millionth of the size of a yeah. meter. So you've got stuff that in the, the very hot environment of the star can't exist, and then it gets sped out, it cools off, and all sorts of stuff starts to... Right. We yes. often refer to this, these stellar winds coming off of red supergiants as smoky. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can take uh, maybe two more questions or so, and, and then, we'll, then we'll wrap and... Okay, uh, so that sounds good to me. Josephine Schindler asks, Phil, what's next for your research? Ooh. Well, um, right now I'm working on a paper with um, several colleagues on some a very interesting, weird kind of star that we found in the Lodge Magellan Cloud. Actually, a colleague of ours, Bruce Morgan, found this really interesting object that um, looks like a wolf or a star, but isn't. It's the central star of a planetary nebula. And these, um, this particular kind is very rare. And so Catherine uh, and I and Bruce and our colleague Ninia Morale in Chile um, have just completed a survey for objects like these in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And so we're right now writing up our first, uh, our first paper about that. Cool. And just to Zoom to the end here. Garrett Thompson says, thanks, Jeff and Phil, for doing this. Uh, what would you say is the most exciting challenges about your current research? Uh, I think that it's the same as for everyone uh, doing anything, which is finding enough time to do all the things that you really want to do 
and do them right. It's, it's, it is an incredible joy to me. I do get paid for doing what I would do for free. Don't get any ideas, Jeff. Um, but um, it's, it's just a lot of fun. And I have the best callings that anyone could ever want. And um, I have an immense amount of fun doing it. But there's never enough time to do everything that I want to get done. Yep, that's certainly true. Um, so, one, one more question okay. quickly. Uh, are the simulations that you showed available for download as a GIF or something? Can we provide those? Um, sure. Um, in fact, um, one easy way would be to just email me, okay. Massey, M-A-S-S-E-Y, at law, L-O-W-E-L-L, -L dot E-D-U, and I'd be happy to send you what I have. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, we are going to be planning to be coming to you for about 45 minutes, which is where we are now. Um, weekly air with our, our Cosmic Coffee series. Thanks for joining us today. Remember, next Thursday we will be about 50 feet that way on the observing plaza here at the Open Deck, Giovanni Open Deck Observatory to give you a behind the scenes look at some of the cool new telescopes we put in there. Um, until then, we're going to maintain appropriate procedures and distancing on our end. And uh, from all of us here at Lowell Observatory, uh, do, we, we do hope you remain healthy and safe during this rather extraordinary time uh, around the nation and around the world. Um, it's great that we have the technology to continue to, to bring really cool stuff like this to you, and we will keep doing it. So thanks for joining us, and come back next week.